We have a lot to do today. Welcome to our second class in Meta Entrepreneurship class. Uh, let's briefly recall last week. Uh, as you remember, we discussed the details of the course and the project. And Saitam provided us information about the team roles and the importance of uh, being a team using the theory, as you will recall. And then we had team sessions where the teams get together. Uh, you selected your communication coordinators, your team leaders. And uh, we had a chance to talk about uh, your first task. So you were assigned for a task due this week. Uh, and during the week, I know that uh, the team members uh, met and completed their assignment for this week. And as you remember, which was to make a market analysis and create your product ideas. Uh, so everybody managed to come up with a product idea and we received your homeworks and we've been reading them. So uh, continuing with this week, um, today we are going to talk about uh, digital literacy and uh, sorry, digital citizenship and meta literacy. Today, Saitram and our guests here, Valerie Hill is here. So today they will be uh, talking about uh, these subjects. And also uh, through the end of the class, we have a guest speaker, an entrepreneur from Second Life. So we will have a talk with uh, our guests too. And at the end of the class, uh, again, you will be assigned for tasks and I will be explaining your tasks for uh, next week. Thank you, Dahlia. All right, we'll begin for today. Our topic, as Dahlia just mentioned, is digital citizenship and meta-literacy. I'm Dr. Valerie Hill, and I have been researching virtual environments for over 15 years with a focus on changing literacy. As the information revolution turned literacy and life upside down, I'm the director of the Community Virtual Library right here in Second Life and the co-coordinator of the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium. I'll put the website here in local chat. If I put links in the chat, you can refer to that later and explore the website. I've taught at all grade levels from first grade through college, served as a school librarian for 20 years. I was a college professor of information science. So I'm going to ask all of you to follow me. You're going to walk with me and follow me to my digital citizenship and meta literacy platform. So if you would walk this way. Wonderful. I see everyone walking and I'll stop right here at the bottom of my ramp so you can look at the white sign beside me to my left. Looks like everyone is gathering. At the bottom of the ramp here, you will see questions that we will address today and they're on a white placard sign. Would you type a Y in the local chat if you can see the sign and everyone's gathered and ready and you can hear my voice? Let me see if you can type a Y in local chat. Great, we're, get, we're all gathering, we're ready. I want you to consider these questions that you see on the white sign and then contemplate them and be prepared to respond to these questions at the end of my talk. And here's the questions. What caught your attention about digital citizenship and meta-literacy? And then another question, what are your thoughts about your future as a digital citizen? So I'm going to ask you now to follow me up the ramp and then use your camera to zoom in on me as I'm going to sit on my slide right here and you can stand on the platform, zoom in on the slide as I introduce you to meta-literacy, 
and some other concepts. Great, everyone's gathering on top of the platform. So this first slide that I'm showing you is an Im image of a recent book that I wrote called Metamodernism and Changing Literacy. Later you can find it at that link. My book addresses the challenges that we face due to these changes. It has now become imperative that we each understand our personal responsibility as digital citizens. Changing literacy impacts us all. Each one of you avatars standing right here below me, there's a new need to look at literacy and a new word for it, meta-literacy, literacy in digital culture. And it requires juggling formats, both physical formats and digital formats. So I'm going to jump over and sit on my next slide, and you can zoom in on this one. Alvin Toffler, he coined this term, and the term is prosumer. He was a futurist, and he began to see that individuals were beginning to create and share content themselves what we now call user-generated con content. He wrote, he wrote this um, term prosumer way back in 1980 in his book, The Third Wave. Then with the internet, the information hier hierarchy toppled. I believe it turned completely upside down. Now we have far more user-generated gener content than traditional media formats such as print books. YouTube has become the number one source of information on the planet, and anyone can create content on YouTube. We are now both consumers and producers of media. It's a portmanteau word. You put these two words together. You put cons producer and consumer together, and you have a new word, prosumer. Have any of you standing here posted content on YouTube or consider other platforms that you might share your own content? Twitter, X, Instagram, Facebook, a blog, a website, Pinterest, Twitch, so many user generated content platforms. So I'm seeing, put a Y in chat if you have. Type in local chat if you have an online account where you mostly upload your content. Maybe it's Instagram or Pinterest. You can type that the name of that platform as well. Probably some of you have accounts, yes, on Pinterest, on Instagram. So name some accounts where you are posting your own content. And it can be a social media account. Many people are using Facebook, sharing content and links there, LinkedIn. Great, I'm seeing link, LinkedIn, Instagram. Keep considering this as we go along, that we are prosumers placing our own content online. And I'll jump over here where you can see a picture of Alvin Toffler. He has a famous quote that I really like because it relates to changing literacy. Alvin Topher said, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Reading and writing, that used to be literacy, but it's more than that now. There is no end to the income stream of information nor is there an end to the constant updates and upgrades and the new apps that we use every day. It is constantly coming at us and changing, and that is literacy now. This constant oscillation. With my hand in the physical world, I'm swinging my hand back and forth. Maybe you can do that with your hand too. Swinging this way and that way between the physical and digital formats. And this aligns to our philosophical moment, which I call metamodernism. 
and many philosophers are beginning to adopt that name for our current era in which we live. Acquiring knowledge in the past meant climbing a ladder toward mastery, final mastery. Not anymore. In metamodern culture, we learn new tools, new apps that are constantly changing while we are evaluating live information and adapting to new devices and software, software updates. And this is changing every day. I repeat, there's no end to the incoming stream of information in which we all, as digital citizens, participate. Each one of us is personally responsible for our incoming and our outgoing information as prosumers. And I will jump over to another sign that's going to introduce us to the term today meta-literacy. So what is literacy in digital culture as all of this information is swinging between physical and digital formats? Well, a term that fits with this personal responsibility, and that's at any age, from really young kids to the elder, elderly, a, a term that fits is meta-literacy. I didn't come up with this term. Mackey and Jacobson in 2014 coined this term to help us better understand how we can be literate in digital culture as prosumers. And this is essential to digital citizenship, thinking about how we can be literate. You can find more information at the website metaliteracy.org. I shared a guest blog, blog post there. I'll put the link here. Later, you can scroll back in the chat and open up this link to read later if you'd like to learn more about meta literacy, what it means, how it applies to you. And you can see on the circle on this slide, zoom in really close, right under where I'm sitting. Use your Alt and your mouse left click, zoom in on that circle, and you can see that we play many roles, each one of us do, as a meta-literate individual, as both a consumer and a producer of information content. Now I mentioned the internet really, the internet really changed literacy because it connected everyone. It gave everyone a voice. Yet not everyone has anything really meaningful to add to the conversation. And that leads to a lot of clutter. The, in, the internet has become a flood of information that is impossible to navigate without meta-literacy. So if you zoom in on that wheel, you see you can be both a participant, a communicator, a translator, an author. You can be a teacher, a peer teacher, a collaborator, a producer, a publisher, a researcher. You have all of those roles available to you. Once we understand what it means to be prosumers and participants in digital culture, well, unless you want to be a hermit living high up in the mountains somewhere with no internet connection at all, we are all connected and we all become aware of the need for digital citizenship. So everyone has a voice online, but as I said, not everything shared is good, meaningful, or even true. In fact, Mackie and Jacobson believe we live in a post-truth world. That's a difficult place to live because we're responsible for evaluating whether things are true, whether they're accurate, that's a big personal responsibility. How to evaluate our incoming information. I'm going to jump over to a slide that has a wheel on it, a colorful wheel. I'll sit on this colorful wheel and you can zoom in and look at all these many elements of digital citizenship. 
Underneath me, you can see digital identity, digital rights, digital literacy, digital communication, digital emotional intelligence, digital security, digital safety, digital use, how to use all of these different tools at our fingertips and in our pockets. Well, the, the many elements of digital citizenship are beyond the scope of this short talk today. Each one of this could be a topic for consideration on its own. But they cover the ethical use of information, cybersecurity, safety, as I mentioned, all these different elements, including communication and even emotional intelligence. And as you look at this wheel, think of all the different con concepts and how they apply to you and your life at all ages. Digital citizenship begins for very young children, as I mentioned earlier. Now, where I work at the Community Virtual Library, we've built a digital citizenship museum in the virtual world of Kitely. And as the support library for the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium, we've branched out to other virtual worlds besides Second Life. You can find more information about that on our website under the tab Communities. Later, you can go to the website, look at Communities, and scroll down. You'll see across the metaverse as we branch out to other places, not just this virtual world. It's important as meta-literate individuals to understand that the metaverse has many, many places that we can go. You could also see on that website, we have live help at our library, at the Info Center, at the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium. Now, we cannot possibly all be experts in digital communication or privacy or cybersecurity or any of the colorful elements on this wheel below me. None of us can be an expert in all of them. So we need to think about how we can work together to be aware of all these elements and how they impact our life and literacy. We can find experts within these fields as the metaverse evolves and new technologies like artificial intelligence advance. And that's the point of being here in Second Life at educational communities such as the virtual the community virtual library and the consortium to find experts to help us in these fields that impact our lives. This is literacy. I hope you're contemplating how literacy has changed as I'm talking about meta-literacy. I'm going to sit on this slide where you see some rocks and they're all balancing by the sea. And if you zoom in close on them, you can read the words on the rocks. I mentioned I was a school librarian for 20 years. And I witnessed the close of the Gutenberg parentheses. And that says print no longer was king of, the, of information. No more encyclopedias, no more print dictionaries. Well, some people still like to you know, go through them, but it's much quicker to Google the definition of a word. How many of you still enjoy books in print? Type a Y if you do on the, in the local chat. Print books. We do have e-readers. We have many formats of, of reading. You can read online. You can read on an e-reader like a Kindle. But if you enjoy print, type a Y in the, in the chat. Print books are not going away. They'll, they're a great format, and they, they will remain. I'm going to pull a sign out real quick just to make sure you're all looking. Look, look this way. Make sure you're paying attention. I wanted to pull this sign out and just plop it in front of me that I'm fascinated by this term, Gutenberg parentheses. They've closed. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Gutenberg parentheses, that was about the year 1500. And in about the year 2000, the B Gutenberg parentheses closed. It's a parenthetical time period of 500 years when print was king. Books were important. People could read. That was literacy, but no longer. 
I think books will always be around. Ebooks, websites, databases, videos, podcasts, blogs, apps, and more. I'll take that sign away. And that's a picture from the Gutenberg Bible. Now we juggle and we balance all these rocks of literacy. And all this juggling, sometimes simultaneously. You may be working on with print and go online at the same time. You may be in the metaverse and going out to the internet to look something up or looking at a book. We juggle them all. And this juggling, simul sometimes simultaneously, is actually changing the human brain. This juggling is a meta-literacy skill, and it's a part of digital citizenship. One can get sucked away by the stream of social media into a self-absorbed whirlpool where you scroll, scroll, scroll, delete, and you realize an hour has passed. More on the dark side of digital culture in a few minutes. Not only must we learn to juggle and choose the best digital tools, we also juggle between worlds, physical, virtual, or augmented. Choosing the best space for a specific purpose, whether working, gaming, social interaction and communication, or learning, that's also a meta-literacy skill. And these new platforms that are emerging constantly, with, they include virtual reality headsets, 360-degree videos becoming mainstream. I'm part of a team of educators researching these environments and because it's impossible to explore them all alone but we want to be aware of them. So a major goal of the Community Virtual Library is to bring together digital citizens to share best practices for becoming meta-literate. To be becoming digital citizens. And we have a lot of tools to help accomplish that. Networking opportunities, that's one of the goals. For example, we're working on a virtual worlds database a network of different office hours and who's in what virtual environment to support virtual worlds for education. Now, I want to talk for just a minute about our online identity. And you can see a picture of myself in the physical world here on this slide. And as avatars, what does it mean to be a live avatar in the metaverse versus a live physical being in the real physical world. Some people call it RL, real world. I like to call it physical world because this is real. I'm going to zoom my camera out and see you all standing here. In fact, I don't want to lose your attention. So I'm going to um, ask you a question here. Think about what it means to be an avatar in the metaverse. I consider myself to be the same in both places. But the metaverse can include games in which we play character roles that are not our real selves. Here in this class, we are embodied as avatars with a sense of presence in a virtual space. And it's real, even though it's virtual. Some of you are thousands of miles away from where I am in the physical world. In physical reality, we're separated. And yet, we're all here together creating a real memory. So I'm going to jump up and I'm just going to ask you just to be sure everybody's focusing on me to walk over to the first slide. Just follow me over here to my first slide. I'm going to walk through all of you avatars, even this zombie here. <laughs> and it's interesting how people create their avatar. And here we are. You're all walking back over to my first slide. Great. Just wanted to see that you're focusing here on me. You're a, you're a real person embodied in an avatar. Now, I'm going to fly back over to my next slide. See, we, we can fly, we can walk. We're in this space, yet we can move around in it, and it, the space is real. I'm going to sit here on this slide, and you can all turn back over here and zoom in on this slide about our philosophical moment, because I'm giving you a lot of information, and I want you all to... Walk a little closer to this one on our philosophical moment. 
Yes, the information revolution has changed literacy forever. And we live in a fascinating, fast-paced time, no matter what it's called. I've adopted this term metamodernism in discussion of our current philosophical era. But there are other names in the running. Nobody's sure. You can't name a moment when you're in it. Time will tell what this era that we're living in will be called. Some of the other names for that people are suggesting are post postmodernism i think that sounds a little redundant i prefer metamodernism another one is hypermodernism time will tell but as i present this topic today here in the metaverse which is a place where metadata constructs a simulation of reality think about that we're here inside a metaphor of our world and as you think about that you are using something called metacognition. That means thinking about thinking. About, about, about. Meta, meta, meta. It's a lot of meta. But yes, I think we use that, that word meta, that prefix, because it's about what we're doing, thinking, where we are. And I think um, we've become meta-modern, and it's certainly time to become meta-literate. Our classrooms have changed. I'm going to sit on this classroom slide, and I want you to zoom in on some of the pictures here on, on the slide where I'm sitting. Zoom in on the, on the top left. I bet the place you're sitting in the physical world doesn't look like that. Hard desks, everyone's sitting in rows, facing the same direction. Learning environments are changing, and they're oscillating between the physical and the virtual world. This term, oscillate, I use it a lot because it is the core of metamodernism. Oscillation, swinging back and forth between things. And if you look at this slide, you will see we swing between the physical, the virtual, and look at the AR picture, the augmented reality, where you can use digital tools to um, link to physical things. And it's on the rise, more and more augmented reality, extended reality, and multiple realities create new ways to learn. And this impacts literacy. With so many tools for learning, both physical and virtual, each one of us becomes responsible for our attention, for our focus. And this is part of meta-literacy and digital citizenship. We work on, with a variety of tools for a variety of purposes and projects. And you're going to do that in this class. I'll jump over to this next slide, which is one of my favorites. I wish I had time to do a whole talk on it, and maybe I'll, I will one day. <laughs> Zoom in on this slide, the preservation of literacy formats, because how to archive all these digital spaces and objects and all of the incoming information and the, the, the content that we create can present a problem as all these formats change. Up at the left, you see the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's an image there. And they can still be read after thousands of years. They were unearthed and carefully preserved. Yet, if we don't figure out how to migrate our digital data from the formats that are right now constantly changing, they could be lost forever. Look at the broken cassette tape. How many of you ever played music on one of those cassette tapes. They're now pretty archaic. People don't have cassette players. The tapes break. And then look at the VHS tapes where we curated videos and the floppy disks. Type a Y if you've ever used any of those formats. For some of you, you may never have. Because now MP3s, that's how we listen to our music. We stream our videos. We use MP4s. But some of you, okay, Magua remembers all of them. And some of you, if you're older, you used a lot of these formats. But when they break, 
if you have not found a way to upgrade to another format, they're lost. All of these are changing the formats of our literacy, but also the hardware that we need to access them. If you don't find the hardware which is becoming obsolete, you cannot access the content. Organizing our digital content on our devices or in the cloud is not always easy. For example, I remember finding an old photo album of my great grandmother's and I turned the crumbling black pages and the pictures were faded and yellow. It was fascinating to see the old clothes that they wore and touch the old print in the album. With digital photos, will our great-grandchildren find our family pictures? Do any of you print them out and put them into albums? Photos are just one format. There are hundreds of file extensions evolving with most content that is now born digital rather than born and created in a physical form. This too is part of meta literacy, and this could be a topic for another presentation, digital archival. If we don't figure out how to preserve much of this content, the archive, the archive, the archivist of the United States believes we are heading for a very scary time, which could even become the digital dark ages, where we can't access much of the content that has been born digital. I saw in the chat, Magua says, sometimes people are converting the old formats to the new. And, and it's a lot of people are working on that, but it's very difficult to, um, to archive everything. So much of it can be lost. So I'm sitting over here on this slide that says, perhaps the consensus will be to adopt this name, metamodernism. Time will tell. I continue my research on changing literacy and how the metaverse can be used for learning. So the next generation uh, will see the metaverse evolve and we'll see if this term is adopted. I do have some references here. I'll, I'll let you just zoom on in them on them quickly. And I'll also let you know that there's a blue box below me here that you can um, click on if you'd like more information about my book. It will give you a folder with information about my book on metamodernism and changing literacy. Now, I hope that each one of you right now is going to ponder your own responsibility for digital citizenship. I hope you'll think critically about your own changing literacy. Um, meta literacy is simply a term to address literacy as prosumers. And for the, there's a lot more um, on the site with the definition of meta literacy. And you'll also find a note card in the white sign at the bottom of the ramp that has two definitions. You can click on that white slide right now and and it's right at the bottom of the ramp and you'll get two definitions i'll just quickly read them here's the quick definition of meta literacy meta literacy is a literacy model developed by thomas mackey and trudy jacobson to support the acquisition production and sharing of knowledge in collaborative online communities communities social media platforms to empower learners to be reflective and informed producers of information, both individually and in collaboration with others. Or in other words, it's simply a new way to think of literacy in digital culture. Digital citizenship, here's the definition, it's the safe, responsible, and ethical use of technological tools for the communication in global digital participatory culture. Now, remember I said there's a dark side to digital culture? Well, let me just grab something out of my inventory here. I'm putting down a black mat. 
I'm going to take you to the dark side of digital culture. And we're going to contemplate some of the issues that we face. So all you have to do, and I'd like to thank Ginger for helping me with that. You're just going to touch that black teleporter and we're going to go into the digital dark room and I will meet you there. And we'll talk a little bit more about the dark side that I mentioned earlier. Just click left click on the black platform and we'll enter the dark side. I see a lot of you are entering it. Perfect. And I'll click on it too and I'll meet you in the dark room. I'm going to ask you to find a bean bag. Let everything res and you can find a bean bag to sit on. You made it. Wonderful. And I know you've learned how to use your camera, the alt zoom key. If you zoom all the way out, you'll see that we're inside the black room. And I hope you all are finding a beanbag to sit on. And then you can find me, zoom in on me up here sitting on my stool by the dark side of digital culture. And on this slide, you see a few of the elements of digital culture that cause us some really, really dark concerns for our future. One of them is our personal dashboards. And what I mean by that, on the internet, we each have a personal dashboard that we create ourselves of incoming information. Unlike libraries in the past in which we had gatekeepers that, that helped provide us with the content that we needed. By a personal dashboard, I mean your yes. smartphone, your computer, your yes. tablet, whatever device you have, it doesn't look yes. like anybody else sitting here. You pick a color scheme, you pick the apps, you pick the background pictures, you pick the wallpaper, you decide what apps are on your phone, your color schemes. It's personalized with your own wallpaper backgrounds. The evaluation of all the incoming information on our devices, it's extremely difficult because as I mentioned, it's nonstop 24 seven, so much information coming at us. I'm going to move over here and you see this exploding cloud right to the, you can cam over to the slide on my left to the right for you. Too much information. Yes, sidearm. I'll stop. Thank you. What a great example of meta literacy and that oscillation. You know, we swing between voice and text and um, too much information on this slide. I bet you felt it. See this image? Do you sometimes feel a little overwhelmed by too much information coming at you? It's impossible to keep up with this endless scroll on our smartphones and the endless upgrades. You never master it. Mastering the information hierarchy back in the age of the Gutenberg parentheses, that's over. That, there is no mastery anymore, and it's a new way to learn. Consider this. Too much information can be as problematic as too little. Way back in the Dark Ages, before Gutenberg created the printing press and there was no access to information, people had such little access. Well, now we're drowning in it. In fact, some futurists predict that we could enter the digital dark ages if, if we do not figure out how to deal with too much information. And now another problem has arisen just in the past months. I'm going to sit over here by the artificial intelligent robot created by AI. <laughs> We've seen this rise in artificial intelligence and it is impacting literacy with generative AI applications. We have AI all around us. Have any of you tried it? Type the name of an AI app in chat if you've tried it. I have, I've tried several of the new 
Yes, chat GPT, everybody's using it, and it's even being embedded into the search engines. Microsoft's search, search engine Bing has embedded it right into search. So there's no going away from it, like it or not. Uh, the ones that come to mind for me, I've used Midjourney and Crayon for some um, from, for some art applications and also um, for some trying some poetry. Can I consider how AI uses human productivity to create new content if we have really good um, prompts? AI prompt engineering is becoming a new skill. But I want you to consider how this impacts our literacy, our reading and our writing. Are we enhancing our creati creativity or are we outsourcing it? I, as a writing trainer, I became a national writing trainer to train teachers to help kids evaluate both reading and, and to become good writers. I want to write in my own words, even though it requires reflection and revision. So later you can look at this blog post that I wrote about AI, and the title is, Will AI Slaughter the Muse? Are we, are we going to be able to help children in the next generation become good writers and only use AI for the best purposes. And alongside that, right next to me, is this slide FOMO. Hey, do we have FOMO? What is FOMO? What is that? What do those letters stand for? If you know, type it in local chat. FOMO. Maybe you've experienced it. Social media posts make it seem like there's something exciting or interesting happening elsewhere. Yes, Anna, it's fear of missing out. You got it. Many teenagers sleep with their cell phones right beside them. Well, I have mine right beside me at night because my elderly mom, who's 91, she might need me in the middle of the night. We all have our phones right beside us. I think maybe they'll be embedded at some time right in our body, but for now they're right beside us. And teenagers do this because they have this feeling that life is taking place elsewhere and they're missing out. Does that seem like a concern to you? Do you know any young people who prefer to text on their phone than to speak out loud? Research has, so, has shown that social media has many harmful effects on young people, particularly teenage girls because of the self-esteem issues of trying to edit their life and have the prettiest life through this, the apps on social media. And yes, we do feel safer when our phone is right beside us. Kids today don't know what it means to be in a world where nobody knows where they are because they're tracked 24-7. And I'll jump over to this next slide. Please zoom in on me over here on the Venn diagram that's about confirmation bias. If you haven't heard of it, it's, it's, it's the idea that we only want to be around and talk with people who agree with us and confirm our beliefs. And it's become a problem on social media. People tend to follow people who agree with them. Think like we do. They're on our side of issues. But that's not how we learn. With confirmation bias, we don't open up our minds to challenge our thinking. We simply confirm our own personal beliefs rigidly, and that is not how we learn. We learn in collision with the ideas of others, through debate of issues, respectful debate, through new perspectives. Freedom of speech, intellectual freedom, has been challenged in the media. And it's, import, it's an important right for human beings to be able to speak freely and think freely. The ability to disagree yet remain respectful is important in both physical and virtual environments. But social media makes this difficult. We can simply swipe away content we disagree with. Just remove that individual and delete them from our personal dashboards. And look at this next one, big data. Look at the big eyeball. 
is big data mining all of our data like big brother watching if you've ever read 1984 i sometimes think google knows more about me than i know about myself it archives our photos it remembers everywhere we've ever been the data algorithms our phones track our every movements even when we don't turn them on surveillance cameras watch where we go perhaps privacy is dead. Type a Y if you're concerned about this, about privacy, cybersecurity, or big data mining. We don't understand all the applications for the future. We just know that it's already happening. If it concerns you a bit, type a Y in the local chat. And think about some other concerns that you might have about life in digital culture. Is there such a thing as internet addiction? When, when we, there's no such thing as boredom. If you ever feel bored, boredom is something I grew up with. We had to figure out how to entertain ourselves. Today, there's no such thing. If you're bored, you just reach for your phone. There's something waiting for you every moment. So this is just a brief glimpse. Each one of these things I've talked about could lead to a whole nother talk cybersecurity, privacy, data mining, all of these concepts. This is just a glimpse into these issues and they're big issues that are emerging as literacy has changed. And they certainly are issues that we need to think about for young children growing up in today's culture. They've never seen a world where people didn't have a phone that they were staring into 24-7. They are all digital citizens. How can we remain human? Will AI be better at creativity and knowledge than we are? I certainly hope not. Personally, I believe there's only one way out of this digital darkroom. And that one way out of here is to embrace our personal responsibility for digital citizenship and teach the next generation that it's their personal responsibility. It's their phone, their digital device, their incoming information. They have to choose wisely. For each one of us, from the youngest child who watches parents staring into their phones to the elderly, and they're told they don't even know how to use the internet, and I'm, I work with some of them, and they're told, go online to www.something online to find out about their health care. That's not easy. We're all digital citizens. So we want to find a way out of here. And I think the only way out is to become digital citizens. So I'm going to give you another teleporter to find your way out of this digital dark room. And we're going to go to the library to discuss and de debrief about meta literacy and digital citizenship. I'm going to res another teleporter and it's bright okay herkese merhaba arkadaşlar çok memnun oldum beni dersinize davet ettiğiniz için de çok teşekkür ediyorum hepinize ee, bu işe nasıl başladım çok kısa zamanınızda çok fazla almak istemiyorum 12 sene önce tamamen can sıkıntısıyla başladım bu işe oyun oynuyordum oyun oynarken hani olur mu ben de yapabilir miyim dedim e, sıfır bilgiyle hiçbir şey bilmeden başladım bu işe. Hani açıkçası yere bir küp bile koymasını bilmiyordum bu işe başlarken. Hani aklımda bunun tohumları oluşmuşken hiçbir şeyden haberim yokken e, kendi kendime yabancı kaynaklara bakaraktan işte bir iki soraraktan e, bu işe başladım. E, evet <gülüyor> bir yandan da yazılıyor galiba. Ee, i̇lk zamanlar tabii ki e, işler bugünkü seviye, seviyede değildi e, ama hani bu girişimcilikteki en önemli Second Life'daki e, temel hedefiniz e, pes etmemek olmalı arkadaşlar. Hani yaptım olmadı olmuyor burada. Yapacaksınız, devam edeceksiniz. Sıkılmadan aynı şekilde her gün 
belki hiçbir şey kazanmayacaksınız. Belki bir sene boyunca hiçbir şey kazanmayacaksınız. Ama e, çalışar, e, çalışarak mutlaka başarı sonunda gelecektir. Hani benim için böyle oldu. Her zaman e, amatör bir ruhla çalıştım. Ama hep çok severek çalıştım. E, kıyafet yaptım burada. Onun dışında başka bir işe girişmedim. Çok farklı dallar da var. Aslında o konularda da arkadaşlarımı davet etmenizi isterim. E, sıf hani ben kıyafet konusunda e, çalışıyorum ama bildiğiniz üzere burada e, bir sürü ada kiralama var. Ada sahibi oluyor insanlar. Onları kiralıyorlar. Bu konuda iş sahibi oluyorlar. E, ne bileyim işte tekne, yat, araba yapımı konusunda Ev, mobilya, saç tasarımı, avatar güzelliği, göz, makyaj, e, dudak, skin, e, makyaj her türlü şey e, yapabilirsiniz. Başka ne e, olur? İşte ha bir de burada aslında yazılım yapan arkadaşlarımız var. Türk arkadaşlarımız. Yazılım yapanlarla da e, onların da bir maceralarınızı dinlemenizi isterim. Ee, gerçekten hani buradaki e, temel taşlardan yazılım yapanlar çünkü bu yazılımlar olmadan e, bazı şeyler çalışmıyor biz de onlara ihtiyaç duyuyoruz örneğin kıyafet yapıyoruz işte e, bir takım e, vücut parçalarımızı saklamamız gerekiyor yoksa kıyafetten pırtlıyorlar ne yapıyoruz kıyafetin içine onların yazdığı bir yazılımı atıyoruz hepsi otomatikman e, al, alfalanıyor e, yok oluyor Hani bunların da hepsi gerekiyor. Gerçekten hani diğer konularda da arkadaşlarımı mutlaka davet etmenizi, onların da tecrübelerini dinlemenizi istiyorum. Ee, az evvel de mesela bahsi geçti. Hani e, sanal ortamda çalışıyorsunuz. Burada ortaklarınız olabilir. E, benim de var burada ortağım. Ha, biz sanal ortamda bırakmadık e, arkadaşlığımızı. Gerçek hayatta da tanıştık. Ama onun dışında sanal ortamda çalıştığım, Rus bir ortak beraber iş yaptığım var. Almanya'dan beraber iş yaptığım ama hiç görmediğim bir hanım var. Hani Türk arkadaşımla görüştüm ama az evvel de bahsi geçmişti. O yüzden vurgulamak istedim. Hani gerçekten burada yüz yüze gelmeden dünyanın evet. dört bir yanından insanlarla ortak iş yapabiliyorsunuz. Ee, başka ne diyebilirim bilmiyorum hani e, sizin varsa sormak istedikleriniz veya benim işime e, yönelik daha detaylı bilgi almak isterseniz isterseniz o şekilde de sorularınız varsa cevaplayabilirim. Merun'un sorusunu cevaplayayım. Evet burada kıyafet tasarlarken bizim çalıştığımız bir takım programlar var. 3D programlar, Blender olsun, 3D Max olsun, rig yapmak için programlar var. Onlar da ayrı kullanıyoruz. İşte Photoshop tarzı başka programlar var. Orada da detaylandırmalarını yapıyoruz yaptığımız ürünlerin. Bir de burada ben de tercih ediyorum açıkçası tembelliğime geliyor. Hazır kalıplar var. Hazır kalıplar üzerinden sadece onları kumaşlandırarak, renklendirerek de satışa sunuyorum. İki şekilde ortaklarımla beraber orijinal ürün, bir de hazır yapılmış olan markette satılan kalıp şeklinde de alıyorum. Onları da dizaynlayıp satışa koyuyorum. Hangi kaynakları kullandım? Ee, YouTube'u kullandım açıkçası. Hani 10-12 sene önce e, çok fazla kullanabileceğim kaynak yoktu. Hani İngilizce, YouTube, Almanca e, oralardan hep baka baka. E, zaten içine girince aslında çok da zor bir şey değil. Hani uzaktan çok zor gibi gözüküyor ama içine girince o kadar da zor değil.
Evet başka e, sorusu olan bahsetmemi istediğiniz <gülüyor> evet evet <gülüyor> çok teşekkür ediyorum evet bunlar bizim kendi imalatımız ee, şöyle arkadaşlar Anna'nın e, sorusunu cevaplayayım e, 12 sene önce işler gerçekten daha kolaydı Second Life'da Şöyle ki çok az tasarımcı vardı, çok az model vardı, çok az e, kaynak vardı. Dolayısıyla aslında biz ne yapsak e, satıyordu o zaman. Hani bir şey koyduğumuz zaman markete hemen e, bir sürü adet satabiliyorduk. Ancak şimdi öyle değil. Burada da ne yapıyoruz işte eskiden pazarlama teknikleri olarak Flickr'ı kullanıyorduk. Ee, Facebook hatta o zamanlar yoktu daha sonra geldi. Facebook'ta reklam yapıyorduk. Flickr'da reklam yapıyorduk. Ee, bir de bloggerlarımız var. Onlara ürünümüzü veriyorduk. Onlar da takip edilen bloggerlar kendi sayfalarında ürünümüzün tanıtımını yapıyordu. Ancak benim için her zaman en önemli pazarlama yöntemi Second Life'ın Marketplace'inin kendi e, reklamıdır. Oraya ücretli reklam veriyorum. Ürünlerim orada belirli aralıklarla gözüküyor. E, bana göre en iyi pazarlama yöntemi bu şu anda. Rica ederim. Evet, başka e, sorusu olan var mı? Aslında uzaktan zor görülebilir ama hiçbir şey zor değil. İşin içine girip gayret ettikçe arkadaşlar her şeyi yapabilirsiniz. Hani bir de burada yapılabileceklerin sınırı yok. Hayal gücünüzün sınırı yok. Hani ne hayal ederseniz onu hayata geçirebiliyorsunuz Second Life'da. Sadece kıyafet değil. Ne bileyim bu kıyafeti siz kanatlı bir kıyafet de yapabilirsiniz. Ee, o, yani tamamen e, farklı şeyler hani neyse aklınızda, hayalinizde e, onların hepsini yapabiliyorsunuz. Evet. Ortalama ne kadar zaman harcıyorum? Şöyle arkadaşlar, e, şimdi ben gerçek hayatta çalıştım, yönetici asistanlığı yaptım. E, şimdi 53 yaşındayım. Aşağı yukarı 40 yaşında e, bu oyuna başladım. E, tabii ki o zaman çalışmıyordum. Çalışmadığım için de bir sürü vakit ayırabildim oyuna. Şimdi şöyle söyleyeyim, sabah kalkıyorum, evimin işini yapıyorum, ondan sonra oturuyorum işin başına. İşimde hani arada tabii ki kalkmam gerekiyor, gerçek hayatta yapmam gereken işlerim oluyor, ev işlerim oluyor. Bütün işimi hallettikten sonra tekrar ekran başına oturuyorum, akşam yatana kadar. Hani çok rahat, 10 saatim çok rahat ekran başında geçiyor. Bu 10 saatimin diyeceksiniz ki hepsini çalışıyor musunuz? Aynen günlük. <gülüyor> e, bu 10 saatin hepsini verimli bir şekilde e, çalışıyor muyum? Tabii ki çalışamıyorum. 10 saat boyunca e, tabii ki verimli çalışamayız. Ama ne yapıyorum? Kafamda işte tasarımı oluşturuyorum. Ya da ertesi gününün programını yapıyorum. Hani hazırlık yapıyorum. E, bu şekilde ama gerçekten hani çok çalışarak e, bu seviyeye gelebildim. Hani öyle iki saat çalışayım, arada ben bunu hobi olarak yapayım olunca hani gerçek işim olmuyor. Bu şu anda benim gerçek işim, gerçek para kazandığım, para biriktirebildiğim, yatırım yapabildiğim işim bu. Ama hobi, hobi olarak yapmıyorum, gerçek işi olarak çalışıyorum.
Ama ilk zamanlar başladığımda tabii hobi olarak başladım. Hani ben de yapabilir miyim? Nasıl olur? Hani belirli birkaç saat ayırıyordum. Çok fazla ayırmıyordum. Ama sonra daha sevdikçe sevdikçe tabii ki daha uzun bunu da yapayım, bunu da yapayım, şunu da yapabilir miyim? E, bu şekilde tabii sa- saatler, süreler uzuyor ekran başında. E, Dalia'nın sorusuna cevaplayayım. E, video çekmek yerine isteyen bütün arkadaşlarıma seve seve hani e, özellikle bu Kalıp yapmada e, daha kısa olur çünkü o şekilde ve sizin için bir giriş olmuş olur. O konuda seve seve size kurs da veririm kendi adamda. Hani böyle topluca bir kurs da yapabiliriz o konuda. Video çekmede sanırım çok başarılı değilim herhalde. Ama e, öğrenmek isteyenlere özellikle hani hazır kalıplarla nasıl çalışılır? Böyle e, çalışmanın hani temel prensibini almış olursunuz. Sonra programlarla geliştirmek hani onlara bakarsınız o da size kalmış yöntemler olacak ama tabii ki programlar konusunda da e, <gülüyor> tabii ki Veriman Hanım e, programlar konusunda da arkadaşlarımız tabii ki mutlaka yardımcı olur e, daha detaylı hani nelere bakabilirsiniz neyi kullanabilirsiniz hangisinden sonra hangisini yapmanız lazım. Tamam memnuniyetle tabii ki tabii ki ee, hani o konuda yardımcı olurum ben herkese hiç YouTube'a da gerek yok hemen ben o şeyde yaparız onu hemen hiç sorun değil o. Dediğim gibi bir de burada aslında sizleri bir tur yapıp gezdirmem lazım bütün arkadaşlara ya da onları çağırmak lazım hani dediğim gibi birçok konuda çalışan çok başarılı olan Türk arkadaşlarımız var. Hatta bir tanesi bakın şimdi online oldu. Bu ada işi yapan bir arkadaşımız. Hani onları da görmenizi isterim. Onların da buraya başlama hikayelerini dinlemenizi isterim. Onlar da belki size ilham olacak. Belki diyeceksiniz ki Aa, kıyafet veya işte ne bileyim mobilya yapımı benim hiç ilgimi çekmedi ama yazılım, yazılım ya da işte bu tarz Ada kirala sat hani benim daha çok e, işime gelir ilgimi çeker diyebilirsiniz. Foxy ee, şimdi ne kadar sürede gelebilirsiniz? Tabi ben başlarken hiçbir şey bilmiyordum ama e, benim sahip olduğum bilgiye e, kısa bir sürede tabii ki sahip olabilirsiniz ama azim edeceksiniz. Azim ederek çalışırs- çalışırsanız çok kısa bir sürede neden olmasın tabii ki gelebilirsiniz. Hani dediğim gibi uzaktan belki çok zor gözükebilir ama e, o kadar zor değil. Şimdi burada asıl en önemli mesele bu Second Life'da e, çok fazla designer var. Hani size söyledim ya eskiden çok kişi yoktu. İşte her konuda e, kıtlık vardı diyeyim hani çok az şey vardı. Ne yapılsa satılıyordu, ne yapılsa satılıyordu. Fakat şimdi... Eskiden farz edelim işte ben bu takımı 700 lindine satabiliyorken e şimdi 399 diyorum e kimi insan o çok pahalı diyor ama diyorum ben yanında 30 renk de veriyorum bunun e ama işte şunlar 99'a veriyor hani bir de şöyle bir şey oldu e, piyasa çok düştü artık Second Life'da hani bu piyasayı kesinlikle Second Life'ın herhalde bir müdahale yapması lazım e, çünkü Emeğimiz gerçekten hani saatlerce duruyoruz, emek veriyoruz. Sonra bir tanesi geliyor, e, benim hazır yapmış olduğum modelin aynısını yapıyor, gidiyor 99'a veriyor, işte 69'a veriyor. Ee, hani bu da gerçekten şu anda hepimizin işini zorlaştırdı. Fiyatların bu kadar rekabet içinde olması e, hepimizin işini bir kat daha zorlaştırdı. Ne yapıyoruz? Daha çok çalışıyoruz. Daha çok çalışıyoruz, piyasada bakıyoruz, takip ediyoruz. Hani eskiden mesela ben yıllarca direndim. Hafta sonu weekend eventlere katılmayacağım dedim. Neden? Çünkü çok ucuza veriliyor. E ne oluyor? Bütün e Ben diyorum bu kadar saat çalıştım, bütün bunları yaptım, ettim. Eşim ben bunu gideyim ne bileyim 50'ye mi vereyim, 69'a mı satayım, 79'a mı satayım hafta sonu? Hani 99'un da altına düşmesin hani sadece bir weekend event için. 
Ama ne oldu? Şartlar beni de evirdi. E ben de şimdi katılmak zorunda kaldım. Hafta sonu katıldığım bir iki tane eventim var benim de. Yani yine onun dışında fazlasına katılmak istemiyorum. Çünkü markamın değerini bir yerde tutmak istiyorum. E Birçok arkadaşımız, çok pardon... <gülüyor> Birçok arkadaşımız e, bu indirim eventlerine katılan aslında kendi topuğuna sıkmaya başladılar. Ne oluyor? Şimdi siz bir malı e, diyelim ki Beymen'den. Beymen sürekli hafta sonu indirim yapıyor diyelim. İşte sizin 3000 TL'ye aldığınız hafta sonu 400 liraya satılıyorsa ne yaparsınız siz? Alır mısınız daha sezon? Sezonda hiç Beymen'den bir şey alır mısınız? Dersiniz ki ben hafta sonunu bekleyeyim 400 liraya alayım 3000 liralık şeyi. Second Life'da da aynı şey söz konusu. Artık e, müşterilerimiz, oyuncular diyor ki e, hafta sonu her şey neredeyse bedava veriliyor. Neden bekleyelim biz neden alalım ki diyorlar hafta arası. Ya da diyor Aa, bu bunu yaptı nasılsa bir ay sonra bir ay kalmadan bu da indirime girecek indirimden satılacak. Dolayısıyla e, bizim sektörde özellikle kadın giyimde e, çok çok çok sıkı bir rekabet içindeyiz şu anda. Burada da eski olmanın verdiği avantajı kullanıyorum. Hilly Harlan markası 12 senelik bilinen bir marka piyasada. Hani ismimin güvenirliğini kullanıyorum açıkçası. Yoksa gerçekten şartlar değişti. Eskisi gibi değil maalesef. Ha, bir de şeyi e, tabii ki bahsetmek isterim size burada. Evet markanız var ama müşteriyle ilişkiniz iyi olmadığı zaman müşteri diğer firmaya gidecektir. Bunu her zaman aklınızda tutun. Şimdi işte bana da geliyorlar sorumlu bir müşteri hani Suç ürünün suçu değil işte ya kendi yanlış almış ya yanlış kullanmış ee, hiç bakmadan satın almış diyelim. Şimdi birçok kişi ne yapıyor designer diyor ki Aa, ben seninle uğraşamam diyor yanlış almasaydın ee, ya da işte şey ya cevap bile vermiyorlar açıkçası hani benim müşterilerimden duyduğum şey bu ben ne yapıyorum diyorum ki ya ne olacak bir tane ürününü değiştirivereyim bunu hani ee, ne ben e, ölürüm ne o ölür en azından gönlü olmuş olur müşterinin diyorum tutuyorum halbuki hiç benimle alakası olmayan konuda ona ücretsiz gidiyorum hani istediği bir ürünü veriyorum onun yerine yanlış aldım diyor aslında yanlış almadı belki ama ne yapayım onun tartışmasını yapmıyorum hani bu konuda da müşterilerim hep şey diyor hani senin diyorlar servisin çok iyi hani sen hiçbir zaman bizi üzmüyorsun her zaman hani e, ve Hani müşteriye, müşteri yazdığı dakika cevap veriyorum arkadaşlar. Bu işimi bırakıyorum eğer çalışıyorsam anında müşteriye cevap veriyorum. Hani bana müşterim yazdığı zaman asla beklemez. Bu sizler için de söz konusu. Kim yazarsa yazsın asla beklemez onun imi. O, önce ona cevap veririm ondan sonra işime devam ederim. Hani bu da sizlerin hep aklında olsun. Önce müşteri gerçekten sanal ortamda olsa... Müşteri her zaman haklıdır arkadaşlar. Evet başka sormak istediğiniz bir şey var mı? Ya da anlatmamı istediğiniz? Eğlenceli bir soru sormak istiyorum. Tabii. Ee, çok fazla Second Life'da zaman geçirdiğiniz zaman mesela rüyanızda da görüyor musunuz? Ee, mesela <gülüyor> biz geçirdiğimizde <gülüyor> geceleri e, işte Second Life'a girip aslında işte event gezip bedava hediye kovalayan kişilerden biri de biz. Ee, yani birbirimizin daha sonradan konuştuğumuzda da işte şey muhabbetleri oluyor. İşte Second Life'da seninle beraberdik işte alışveriş yapıyorduk. İşte dans ediyorduk tarzında. Ya ben mesela çok fazla e, Second Life'da zaman geçirdiğimde ya rüyamda da aynı şekilde Second Life'ın içindeymişim gibi yaşıyorum. Ya bu sizde de oluyor mu? Ee, yok öyle bir şey bende olmadı. Ama şöyle tabii ki ilk başladığım zamanlar hani e, burası yeni bir dünya. İşte keşfedilecek bir sürü şey var. 
tabii ki ben de yaptım e, hani keyfini çıkardım bir müddet e, sonra keyfini işte çıkardım çıkardım baktım e, bir sene sonra yapacak başka bir şey yok artık onu da yaptım onu da yaptım oraya da gezdim buraya da gittim onunla da konuştum bununla da konuştum arkadaşlar edindim e, tamam sonra bir kısır döngüye giriyorsunuz dön dolan aynı şey oluyor dön dolan aynı şey oluyor e, sonra işte arkadaşlarım da oyundan e, gerçek hayatta işte kimin kimi bir çocuk daha yaptı işte kiminin işleri yoğunlaştı e, biri avukattı ben çok iş aldım dedi e, onlar ondan sonra hani second life'ı terk edince ben de böyle tek başıma kalınca ya olur mu olmaz mı hani o şekilde ama açıkçası hani <gülüyor> işler konusunda da ee, hiçbir şey akşam yatarken de kafama takılmıyor, aklıma da gelmiyor. Çünkü gün içinde illa ki bitiriyorum onu, ona göre hep programlıyorum. Bütün programımı ona göre yapıyorum. Eğer bir şey başladıysam onu ya bitirecek seviyeye getiriyorum. Yani akşam gece aklıma bir şey takılmıyor. Teşekkür ederim. Rica ederim.